with a novel? She might be if she could get it finished. She didn't get on very well. Oh, dear. And it rained the whole time. In fact, I had been vainly to write for nearly a week when I met Mr. Talent in the hotel lounge. He was a gentle, moth-like man, very tall and thin, with limp-looking hands and an expression of passive and enduring obstinacy. He was reading a manuscript, and I was so bored I made the fatal mistake of asking him about it. Your own? Even so. I see you are a woman of letters. Would you like to look at it? It would be an honour. How kind. A stranger, knowing nothing of my hopes and aims, yet willing to undertake so onerous a task. Not at all. I fancied I might take it to my room, read the first page and the last, and flick through the rest. Let me read it to you now. Oh, I... It might be best. I am considered to have a particularly fine reading voice. Oh, well, I... Uh, I should be delighted. The Unstrung Harp, Part One, Chapter One, Prologue. It was a quiet evening in November, and the small... At first, I listened, even taking in the sense of the words... I took in all the first six chapters. They were unbelievably dull. I imagined that something would, in time, happen. He made no reply. It never did. Part two, chapter seven. Marjorie motored down with Horace to Brighton that morning. It was a fine spring day. The and book the was flat, formless, a plethora of stale, borrowed, empty ideas. One waited for the culminating platitude as one would for a twinge of toothache. I thought he would pause after until a while. Until he found and took up the egg whisk um, again. <clears throat> I say, could we not have a little pause? Uh, uh, perhaps a bite to eat. But this is the most exciting moment. Now that the plot has reached its climax, the culminating tragedy. Uh, of course. Forgive me. Chapter... 39. Marjorie put her head into her hands and sobbed convulsively. If he doesn't stop soon, I'm going to have to kill him. How? Strangling? Hanging? The cheese knife on the sideboard? And a single ray of golden light struck upwards from the horizon. Then, with one accord, they turned and went back together to the house. The end. Well. Well? And after a little discussion... Oh, no, you're just saying that, really. He told me about his will. You see, I am leaving all my money for the posthumous publication of my work. You have been so kind, I would like you to be my executor. Oh, I couldn't possibly. Oh, it would involve no work on your part. Pay another critic to read the manuscripts, pay a publisher to publish them. Then... I shall not be forgotten. I left the hotel early next morning, and I tried not to think about Mr. Talent. But a few months later, I read his obituary in the Times. Then I remembered the manuscripts. I am from Hainault, Hainault and String. I have here a box of manuscripts as belonging to the late Mr. Talent. Is it full? I believe so. <coughs> I should warn you, the relatives of the deceased are extremely angry. Mr. Talent was possessed of a substantial fortune, and nothing has been left to them. They say that the manuscripts are worthless. How do they know? It appears that from time to time, Mr. Talent has read one or two aloud. Ah. They threatened to take proceedings. Letters began to come in from Mr. Talent's relations. We think you should know Cousin William's death was certainly hastened by the disappointment that we have all experienced. It is my belief you should be charged with manslaughter at the very least. I had a friend, a freelance journalist with a conscience. I knew he would be glad of a job. I asked him to read the manuscripts. Will it depend on my verdict whether they're published or not? Some will have to be. But what should be the standard? You must decide. What if I find a masterpiece? When you begin to wish you had never accepted this little job, and you will, remember that at least the damn things were never read out loud to you, and be thankful. Meanwhile, more and more letters came from Mr. Talent's relations. They were very numerous, very poor, and very uninterested in literature. I was notified the proceedings were being instituted. Well, poor old Talent. 
Have you read them all? Yes. How can you possibly feel sorry for him? Don't start, for God's sake. He'll haunt you, like he haunts me. When I sit by my fireside, sometimes I think I can hear him reading. When I'm just going off to sleep, I dream that he's looming over me, like a large, pale, garrulous moth. I dreamed about him too. I dreamed he appeared to me in the watches of the night and told me exactly how each plot came to him. You must come to the meeting. What meeting? I've called the relatives together to see if we can settle something. I hope we can. I've hired a hall. I say, you're looking a bit run down. <laughs> Talent is ever with me. We had a stormy meeting. It was obvious that these people did need the money. Orphan children needing a chance in life. Frail old people wanting care and rest. The desperate middle age trying over again to set themselves up. And it was all being kept from them. And in your considered opinion? In my considered opinion, the books are utter rubbish. No! And at that moment, as I was distractedly looking out of the window of the meeting hall, I distinctly saw talent pass in the street. There he is. It's him. Who? Him, talent. I, I just saw him. I beg your pardon? Calm down, old girl. I tell you, I saw him. And let us keep to the matter in hand. Now, whether Mr. Talent walked past the window or not, indeed, whatever his status beyond the grave, the legality of what we propose is not affected. Facts are facts. You've got the money. They want it. There he is again. Look. Look. There he goes. Can't you see him? I think after the meeting we should go round to the chemist and get you a little something for your nerves. After this, Hardly a day passed without my seeing talent. I began to fear for my sanity. Meanwhile, it had finally been decided that half the money should be divided among the relations. Payments have been made in accordance with the agreement. Jolly good. Unfortunately, some of the recipients have reported a strange and disquieting fact. What is that? They say they're being haunted by Mr. Talent. I'm afraid the doctors fear for their reason. What? form does the haunting take? Whenever they're alone at home, lying in bed or otherwise taking their ease, they continually hear Mr. Talent reading from his works. I wondered if he would begin to read to me soon. I went to see a specialist. Acute nervous prostration, young lady, is your trouble. You need rest. Plenty of rest, that's all. Don't worry, we've got a bed for you here. Nurse? There now, that's right, dear. Let's do your pillows and you can just lie back. Now, I'll turn down the lamp and you can have 40 winks. That's it. Chapter One, Beginnings. It was a gentle evening in late March and the early bulbs were just beginning to push up from their beds in the warm earth when Charles and Esmeralda... No. You've got to believe me. I know I'm not mad. Perhaps I should get a priest, you know. Exorcism. And if it's not madness, then there's only one other explanation. What do you mean? Just keep walking and tell me again the next time you see him. There. There he is. Do you see him? Yes. After him. Quick. He's running away. Oh, no, you don't. Oh, ow. My shoulder. Let go. Oh, no. My God, he's solid. I'll say. He's not a ghost. Why aren't you a ghost? I never died. It was in the paper. I put it in. I was in America. It wasn't difficult. And, and what about the continual haunting of me? And of your unfortunate relations, all driven into asylums? What about that? Yes, very interesting. Interesting? It was in a great cause. Perhaps I should explain. Perhaps you should. I assume you are not aware of my standing in the field of experimental progressive psychology. You see, I am not really a novelist. No. Really? Those novels were just part of the experiment. What experiment? In the plural, really. 
There were many experiments. But what for? It will be world famous, I think I can safely say. All this has given me exceptional opportunities, you see. Particularly the hypnotic effect of the reading. So it was you, reading? Oh, yes. And it was you who walked past the window when we were having our meeting? Yes, fascinating spectacle. It has provided some excellent material for my thesis. And what is that? You... You... It is a treatise. A treatise that will eclipse all former work in the field. It is an exhaustive inquiry into the power of human endurance under supernatural suggestion. That wasn't a ghost story. That was just an after-dinner joke. It's not a good one, though. It was a story with the suggestion of a ghost. They can be the most frightening sort. Was that frightening? I don't think so. It was far too cynical. What is wrong with cynicism? I've never thought it a very womanly attribute. Do you know, Mr. Wallace, I have an aversion to the word womanly. Why? Violet and I were in the park distributing leaflets for the Women's Freedom League. Oh, gosh, yes. We made the mistake of handing one to a middle-class lady in black silk. She hit me. <laughs> she brought down her umbrella with some force on Violet's head, remarking, Thank God I am a womanly woman. I am very much in agreement with the aims of your movement, but I deplore your methods. You can hardly be surprised at the violence you provoke. Why do you engage in these struggles? Why do innocent young ladies go provoking outrages from policemen? Don't any of you understand that man is a savage animal, imperfectly domesticated, and a large part of the art of living, for men and women alike, is never to give anyone the slightest chance of throwing you downstairs or taking you by the neck. We've got civilization up to the point of just about stopping unprovoked assaults. But provoked assaults? What rubbish. Oh, how practised you are at scornful dismissal. It must be what makes Rebecca West's literary criticism so penetrating. I disapproved of your stories, and I said so in print. Perhaps it was a mistake, but it's hardly a crime. Is a reviewing really such a vile occupation? That depends on how it is practised. It can have very unpleasant repercussions. For the poor author? Sticks and stones, surely. I mean for the reviewer. How so? I could tell you a story to illustrate my point. Oh, yes. Do tell us another story, Mr. Wallace, if you like. Miss Fairfield might not like it. It's not a very nice story. <laughs> I'll be brave. Very well. <laughs> 